It is great to be here. You know, we love Signal. It's this one time a year when we get to all get together here in this old brewery with doors halfway up the wall for some reason. But to get to talk about some cool things, like the role of APIs in a rapidly changing economy. And the role of communications in building great businesses. And of course, we'll talk about some new products and maybe even do some live coding. Now, there's this theme that we love talking about at Twilio. You'll hear us talk about it all the time because we believe it wholeheartedly. It's this idea that code is creative. See, there's this Hollywood narrative about the antisocial, in the basement, hacker, guzzling Mountain Dew, right? And I don't think that's right at all. In fact, I think writing code is much more like making art or music than it is like doing some obscure math equation. Why? Because we've seen amazing things come out of our developer ecosystem. We've seen a team of developers at Oxford build a system that helps identify the early signs of Parkinson's just by making a phone call to a hotline. We've seen multiple developers, our community in the past year, volunteer to help refugees in Greece find shelter by calling an IVR. We've seen a company build an internet-connected watch that can detect a heart attack in real time and notify emergency services. Amazing things that we've seen built. And the reason why is because it's never been a better time to be a software developer. Because with the agility of software and the infrastructure available to software developers today, you can build absolutely amazing things. Because you can pull off the shelf, any developer can pull off the shelf world-class compute and storage from someone like Amazon Web Services or Azure or Google Cloud. And then you can pull in payments from Stripe and communications from Twilio. And all these API-first companies provide the infrastructure to any developer to be able to build whatever their idea is. But that's not all. Because a developer today can truly change the world with a text editor. Think about that. You pull these services off the shelf, you write some code, you upload your app to an app store or put it online, and it's live in front of billions of people overnight. And that is unprecedented. That's why we love celebrating the spirit of building with something we call the Hall of Doers. And we want to celebrate a few of the people in our community who in the past year built something really special. Let's meet a few of our doers. Our first doer for 2017 was tasked with rebuilding the call center for his company with the goal of dramatically improving the customer experience around getting financing for a new car purchase. This doer started by replacing their legacy solution. That part was easy, but this doer was just getting started because he started experimenting with new things. How can we engage with customers? How can we build something more and more interesting? And then he built chat, so you could chat with an agent while you're trying to get car financing. Then he used TaskRouter to try to figure out how to route every communication to the best available agent. Then he used Twilio Sync to actually synchronize the whole website flow so the agent could actually help the customer with whatever they were trying to do online and speed up the agent getting up to speed. And he just started building more and more and more, every sprint, figuring out well, some other way to improve the customer experience. And it was so cool, this journey that this doer went on. So he took the needs of the business, and he got creative, building a better experience for his customers and for his fellow coworkers all at the same time. So let's give it up for our first doer of 2017, Mark Quinn of Car Finance 24-7. Let's hear from Mark. All right, now our next doers had a really awesome story. It was a serendipitous meeting. He was about to have his first child and had founded a company building applications. And she had just started a new job at a leading children's charity in the United Kingdom. And together they set out to do something special. See, they wanted to prepare expecting mothers in underserved markets and at-risk moms to help prepare for the 
becoming a parent for the birth of their child. Not just the birth, but also what to do after you have a child. It is a harrowing experience. So they decided that effective communications to expecting moms was the best way to help them prepare for this. And it was the heart of the strategy, but the challenging part about this story is that there's a lot of regulation about contacting expecting mothers. It's a medical thing. You've got to keep all the private information private. And so they tackled regulatory regimes by building a subscription system with a bot that actually sent educational information to these expecting moms via SMS while keeping all their information private. But that's not all, because they also built an SMS-based chat to allow practitioners to talk to those patients, all with keeping the private information private and connecting those expecting moms who are at risk with a network of people to help them. And so our two doers built this amazing application for the NSPCC. Please give it up for Tom Mullen of Develop and Kathleen Kaur of the NSPCC. Really cool, really cool application. And we're going to check out with, uh, chat with Tom a little bit later. And our last doer of 2017 knew that when you have to move, it is a really stressful experience, right? Not only did you, you, you finally found the perfect place to live, which is, that's hard enough, but then you have to take all your worldly possessions and put them in a truck and hope they get there safely. And that is a really stressful experience. And for some reason, whenever you need to do this, all your friends are suddenly busy that day. So you never have the help you need. And so the next doer asked himself a question. He said, what if moving was as easy as calling an Uber? And this next doer was inspired by the on-demand economy to say, can we build a better experience and make it as easy as some of these on-demand economy experiences? And it was two years ago, not that long ago, just two years ago, the Le Tonton Lavreux launched with this vision of a man with a van. And just two year, in just the last two years, they've traveled over 33,000 miles, moving over 150,000 items on behalf of their customers. They connect you to your mover using Twilio to move any sort of items, large or small. So please give it up for our last doer of 2017, Clément Sauvage, the CTO of, yes, let's give it up. Let's give it up for Clément. All right, awesome. That's our hall of doers. You know, we love celebrating doers. It's one of our favorite things. That spirit of building is so awesome. See, it's the basis of this billboard that we've been running in San Francisco for the past few years. And this billboard is, is actually kind of famous. It's got just three words on it. It leaves a lot to the imagination. Here it is. It just says, ask your developer. And see, there's a lot of explanations. Everybody has this own interpretation of what this means. I've seen, I've seen this discussion on Twitter once where this philosophical debate, what does it mean for one to have a developer? But here's what it means. See, if you believe, as we do, that competing in business is fundamentally a creative endeavor, creative problem solving on behalf of your customers, right? And if you believe as we do, that code is creative, it's not just math, then what you need to do is take your business problems and take those business problems to your developers and say, how can software help us build a better business? Instead of handing those developers a solution, a spec, hand them the problems. That's what asking your developer is all about to us, unleashing that creativity. And you know, we see this happening in companies all the time, and not just Silicon Valley, and not just startups, but every kind of company is becoming a software company. Right? Some of the biggest or oldest companies are embracing this concept, whether it's Nike, who now employs more software developers than shoe designers, or whether it's General Electric, who's on track to become one of the top 10 software companies by revenue in the world, or whether it's Starbucks, who recently had a Computer World headline that said, forget coffee, Starbucks is a tech company. Or whether it's Goldman Sachs, who now employs more software developers than Facebook does. Every company is becoming a software company and starting to ask their developers. In fact, 
customers that we've talked to have gone through the same process. When ING asked, how can we modernize our global contact centers with new channels, what did they do? They asked their developers. And now they're building a global call center strategy on top of Toyo. When Morgan Stanley asked, how can we enable employees to message with customers in a compliant way, what did they do? They asked their developers. And now they're building this compliant messaging strategy on top of Toyo. And when TransferWise asked, how can we secure the accounts that allow over a billion pounds of transactions between trusted parties, what did they do? They asked their developers. And the developers built the account security model on top of Twilio. All of these customers and many more are taking their customer experiences to the next level because when they have these business problems, they ask their developers, how can we solve this business problem? And developers do what they do best. They apply that creative energy and they think about all the tools they have available to them and they start building solutions. And we see this in companies of every size and every shape, new and old, in every industry. Every company is becoming a software company. In fact, the applications built on top of Twilio in the past year have powered over 28 billion interactions with people around the planet. When you add up all the calls and the texts, that's a lot of customer engagement that developers are driving, that creative energy. And I want you to meet somebody. Meet Team Twilio. Over 900 people, builders, operators, people on the front lines helping you with your applications every day. And you know, half of our team is our R&D group, software developers. And see, we talk to you, our customers, every day. And we learn what you need in order to build great engagement into your applications. And we have these product priorities that we've gotten from you. You've told us what you need. And we've internalized them, like a North Star to us. And everything we do is to further these product priorities. And I wanted to share them with you today. Our first product priority is to deliver superior quality. Because trust is the number one thing that we sell. Trust that when you build on top of our platform, your applications are going to work, and they're going to work great. The second is to give you flexibility. Because no two companies are the same. No two companies have the set of other services you need to integrate with. No two companies have the same idea of what a great customer experience is. Every company is on its own journey. Our job is to give you the flexibility to get exactly what you want, to build it exactly how you want it. And our third product priority is to get you to production fast. So you get the value of all that flexibility, but you get that value ever faster. You don't get slowed down. Because agility is the key to unlocking new potential. We believe experimentation is the prerequisite to innovation. So the more experiments you can try, the faster you can get your applications to production and scaling, the more ideas you can try. That's key to innovation. And so we measure ourselves against you know, how we're doing against these product priorities. And so think about quality. We measure our API availability religiously. And we're proud to say that we've hit it yet another year of five nines availability of our API. In fact, we've only, thank you. In fact, we've only missed five nines one month in the past three and a half years, right? And we continually measure and iterate and constantly focus on this metric. But you know what? API availability is only the beginning. The API can be up and serving up a bunch of errors. That's not useful to anybody. So we measure something we call the success rate. How many of the API requests that are coming in are successfully served? Well, for yet another year, we've served way in excess of five nines success rate as well. And see, by measuring and systematically reducing causes of errors, we continually drive improvements to drive the success rate far in excess of five nines, right? That's to us what superior quality is all about. Now, when we think about giving you flexibility, that means a lot of things. It means giving you a lot of channels to communicate based on whatever your experience is that you're trying to build. It's not just SMS and voice, but it's also things like Facebook and push and email and chat and video that we've added to our platform. It's also things like going global with as many countries of global infrastructure as we have. And it's also things like intelligent services that do a lot more heavy lifting for your application. 
And you get to pick and choose these building blocks as you need them, as you're discovering what you need and what your business needs, and you can integrate them at your pace. Right? And that's what flexibility affords you, to get it exactly the way you want it. And so we keep building. And in fact, in a world where many enterprise companies deploy to production a new version of their software two, maybe three times a year, what well, Twilio, last year, we deployed to production over 6,000 times. Stop clapping, because this year we're going to deploy over 30,000 times. Now you can clap. That's five times where we were just a year ago. That's the value of continuous delivery. Right? So what does that mean for you? Right? Smaller deployments, more frequent deployments, more incremental changes means that we can ship more often with fewer mistakes. It lets us get more done on your behalf. In fact, in the past year, these are just some of the major features or brand new product lines that Twilio has launched to help you build your applications. So what's in those deployments? Well, a stream of innovation. Obviously, we started with voice and SMS, but now it's so much more. Whether it's our programmable chat product, our brand new sync product, our, our data synchronization primitive, programmable wireless, the world's first completely programmable mobile network that Twilio brought you, or whether it's our serverless product that we launched a few months ago called Twilio Functions that makes it easier than ever to build and scale uh, by building applications directly on Twilio. It's all of these things. We listen to you, and we're delivering the innovation that you want from us. In fact, in the past year, we delivered a major new feature or entire new product line on average every three and a half business days. So I'm really proud of what we've accomplished in order to give you more flexibility to build applications that you want. And then the last of our product priorities is getting you to production fast. And so the way we think about it, we have a whole stack of innovation designed to continually accelerate your development. What started with our super network connectivity into the voice and messaging networks of the world. Then came our programmable communications cloud with all the APIs and intelligent services that you need to be able to build upon that super network to reach the people of the world. That made it even easier to build communications in your apps. And now our newest aspect, the Twilio engagement cloud, a brand new set of declarative APIs that actually take use cases, encapsulate best practices, and give you an API that means you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Each layer of this stack is designed to get you to production faster with the flexibility that you need. And it's all about building trust, quality, choices, getting to production fast. This is all about building trust with developers. Because when you pick a platform, you want to know that not only is that platform going to get better all the time without you having to write any more code, but also you want to know that you can trust it reliably because your product is only as good as the platforms you build upon. And that's why over 1.6 million developers are on the Twilio platform today. And the value of this big developer community is that it makes Twilio better for all of you every day. The more developers are on Twilio, the more developers who are out there answering questions on Stack Overflow when you've got questions. The more marketplace integrations we have that extend Twilio into new directions by adding in more functionality. The more developers we have in our community, the more insights we get into how we can better serve you, and it drives our roadmap even faster. That's the power of community. Now, I'm excited to share with you today a stat we've never shared with anybody before. It's that in EMEA, we have over half a million developers. It's about a third of our entire developer ecosystem is in EMEA. And this means we've been investing a lot in this market to make the developer experience great, to build out the super network in EMEA. And there's one other thing that trust means in EMEA these days. I'm sure it's on many of your minds as well, GDPR. And so today, I want to share with all of you that Twilio is currently on track and committed to delivering full GDPR compliance for May of 2018. And this is a substantial amount of energy that we're putting in, as I'm sure many of you are, to meet the GDPR compliance requirements. But it's one that we're excited to take. Now, to hear more about many of these innovations and things that we've been building for the past year, I want to invite up someone 
to share those details with you. Please welcome up Patrick Malatak, the VP of Product here at Twilio. Pat, come on up. Thanks, Jeff. So as Jeff mentioned, every company is increasingly asking their developers to solve more and more problems for their customers. And as software moves from the back office to the core of our customer experience, developers are getting asked more and more questions. They're asking you, does it scale? Is it secure? When will it be ready? Well, we have some code that we think can help out with this. So I um, want you to take a look at this code. It's the most important code you're going to see all day today. It's the code that counts. The code that counts. No, not literally the code that counts. Um, so at Twilio, we want you to focus on the code that makes meaningful experiences for your customers. And that's why we built the Twilio runtime. Runtime is the developer experience you get for building on Twilio. It's part of every Twilio product. And it's something that we've been investing in for over a decade. Runtime helps you focus on the code that really matters. With Runtime, there's tools for exploring the API, writing Twimmel. There's a debugger to help you understand application failures. And on the security side, we have audit events to enable infrastructure monitoring. And there's single sign-on with role-based access control. We took all the common patterns needed for building any application and made it part of the Runtime, saving you your most precious asset, your time. Earlier this year, we introduced functions as part of the Runtime. And for those in the room that haven't used functions, functions is part of a new class of computing known as serverless computing, which eliminates ops and abstracts away the operating system and compute limitations. And Twilio Functions is powered by Node underneath the hood, giving you an execution environment that scales on demand for workloads of any size. And your applications are already seeing the benefit of this. Consider this application above. It's scaled from a cold start to over a million uh, requests in a day, uh, and then back down again to nothing the next day. No work required by the application developer. So functions help you scale on demand. Functions also improves your speed of development, letting us host your code for you. And functions runs directly in the Twilio cloud, so you get benefits like low latency. And functions is secure by default. It takes advantage of best practices of building on top of Twilio, and you're able to utilize our ISO 27001 infrastructure for your applications. With functions, our goal is to get your apps to production scale faster. And although it's only been live for just a few months, functions is already Twilio's fastest growing product ever. Today, I'm excited to announce to all of you that functions is getting even better. We're adding support for packages. Now, you can log into the Twilio console and directly add any NPM package to your application and get back to focusing on the code that counts. So that's our runtime. Now, building successful communication experiences is about more than just having a great platform. For those of us in the room with experience, building great communication experiences can be difficult to get right. Sometimes it feels like we're embarking on a, a little bit of 15th century exploration. You start in Scandinavia, everything's going as planned, and you start exploring the various societies of Northern Europe. And then, just as you're getting over towards Iceland, bam, dragon. <laughs> God, I hate dragons. Uh, so this is the actual map that introduced to the world the concept of here be dragons. And developers have been using it in their code ever since. We all know that sometimes building software, unexpected things can happen. Things can go from very simple to very complex quite rapidly. Consider this example. Imagine you want to call your customers and remind them to ask their developer in a few different countries. Doesn't seem that hard, right? Until you realize your voice application is going to need to be able to speak multiple languages. Again, something maybe we can tackle. But then you're going to need to be able to understand speech in multiple different languages as well. And it gets trickier from that. 
you probably want to be able to understand multiple different dialects, even within the same language. And how about answering machine detection in different countries with different tones? You can see where all this is going. Yep, you guessed it, dragons. To combat these dragons, we have built intelligent services like our media engine. The media engine is the core of how Twilio manages audio and video. In just this past few months, we've introduced support for text-to-speech, answering machine detection, tuned to all the different individual countries of the world, and speech recognition now supports 130 different dialects, including four in Spanish alone. And we've expanded the footprint as well, with 10 different geographic locations across four continents and four different interconnect sites. And we've made our recordings better as well as part of our media engine. We now have support for multi-channel recording, recordings uh, in video, and we've allowed you to integrate with third parties like IBM Watson to do recording analysis. So back to the simple example again. Now imagine we wanted to send an SMS. Just a to, a from, a body. How hard could it be? Well, first, you'll run into challenges with content. For example, Unicode characters, like emoji, can actually change the max size of your message length. And I bet you didn't know this, but in China, content needs to be sent with pre-approved templates. In places like India, there are restrictions around the time of day that you can send. And in Brazil, they recently rolled out variable phone numbers for different regions. So you'll have to be able to uh, take that into account in your application. And this is all code that many of you would otherwise have to write. <coughs> to me, it sounds like dragons, dragons, dragons. <laughs> and so that's why we built the messaging copilot. With Sticky Sender, we can make sure that your messages come from the same phone number in every different region. And with GeoMatch, we can send from a local uh, country, country uh, phone number in a local country. And then there's content features like link shortening, and automated opt-out processing, and support for common keywords like help and stop, help with privacy and compliance. How about, though, when your customers try to talk to you? As a human, we understand what this means. But it can be quite a bit harder for machines. It's especially hard when your customers keep varying how they say what they want. Next thing you know, you're trying to figure all this out. You're reading books around natural language understanding and machine learning and considering going back to uni for a PhD. And that's why we introduced Twilio Understand. Twilio Understand is our newest intelligence service. And it helps Twilio understand what your customers mean, not just what they said. Understand takes phrases from your customers and it breaks it apart, the things that are meaningful for your applications. We parse out things like an intent, namely what your customers want. And then we're able to parse out entities. Right? These are the details of, of, your, uh, of what the customer experience is, things like products. And the process for making understand work is pretty straightforward. First, you create a model. You define intents and entities as part of that model creation. You tell, your, you tell Twilio what those intents are for your business. Um, and what your business entities are. And then you collect a bunch of tag data. Right? You take that collected data, you train the model. You feed it into Twilio, and then you can actually query the model with live production data uh, and get meaningful inputs back out. So let's see it in action. So. As I'm getting started over here, so uh, the example we're going to walk through is building uh, a, a natural language understanding model for uh, something like a phone tree. Uh, and the, the approach we're going to take today is we're going to have a phone tree that can automatically detect between sales or customer support. So here we are. We've already set up the entities, the two entities here, contact sales, contact customer support, uh, or the two intense contact sales and contact customer support. And uh, we've loaded in the entities. The entities in this example are going to be our products, so voice, messaging. Uh, and we already have this model uh, running. And, and so what we're looking at here is a node REPL. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, try and run a query through the existing model. 
Uh, now, we haven't trained the model with any data um, uh, just yet. Uh, so we'll run a query to it, see what Twilio Understand comes back with, uh, knowing that there's no training data that we, we've loaded into the system yet. So the first thing we're going to do, just go to services here. This is our uh, Twilio Understand service. Queries create and query. Uh, and then I'm going to pass in text here. Uh, I want to talk to someone about messaging. OK, so this is what I'm going to feed into this uh, phone tree. Um, and I need to go ahead and tell it what language this is going to be in. Uh, and since we're in preview still, this is an ENUS. Um, great. So that's us sending off the query. Uh, and then I want to make sure I get the result here in case I made a mistake. Uh, then we are going to dot log and the results of this request. Um, looks good to me. Oop. What did we say here? Services is not defined. Uh, so let's see if we can load in our services here. Uh, why would our services not be defined? Ah, that's it. Service no S. There we go. Cool. Uh, so, so you see, it didn't return anything meaningful. So we asked Twilio Understand what was the intent of uh, this request, and Twilio Understand uh, wasn't able to return anything meaningful. It's because we haven't trained it with any data yet. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to go ahead and train the model here. Um, and so we have a few uh, example utterances uh, that we want to uh, train the model with. So utterances are basically phrases uh, that your customers might say. And what you do is you feed those phrases into Twilio, and you tell it what that intent should be. Um, and you take this training data, you load it into Twilio, uh, and then you train the model on top of that. Um, so these are some of our uh, sample utterances here. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, send all of those up to Twilio. So uh, we will say talk to sales samples. Uh, and then for each, we want sample. Uh, and then we're going to go hit the service this time. Uh, with intents, um, and we have a uh, environmental variable, which is the intent SID. This basically uniquely represents the intent uh, talk to sales. Um, and create, ooh, samples.create. Uh, and then we're going to pass in tag text here. And that tag text will be the sample. Uh, and then we will also tell Twilio the language, uh, which is going to be, again, ENUS. OK. And then we want to pipe out the results again to the console in case I make a mistake like the last time. Uh, and that will be console.log. I think that looks right. Just once over it. No. Unexpected token. Ah. OK. Let's try that one more time here. Not intense. Actually, it should still be in the REPL here. Services dot intense, intensive samples, create, tag text, language, that looks good. Then uh, that should be then there we go. No. We'll try it 
try this one more time. Uh, if anybody sees the issue here, this should be then. There we go. There we go. Cool. All right. So that just fired off uh, 10 different REST requests to Twilio's API, uh, sending up that uh, uh, sample data. So there's one last step we need to take here um, before this is going to work for us, uh, which is that we actually need to tell Twilio to uh, uh, build the model. So there's a uh, model builds uh, dot create. I'm going to go ahead and say here. And then once again, if uh, we get a failure, as we have gotten on a few of these, <laughs> we want to write it out to the, line, the command line. Okay, and then model dot status. Close, close again. There we go. Cool. So what that's doing is basically just told us with all that sample data we'd sent up, go ahead and um, uh, retrain uh, our, our model, uh, and now we can go ahead and query it again. And so for that, we're actually just going to use the same query we'd sent in um, earlier, which is that I want to talk to someone about messaging. Great. So now we send in that query, and you can see now it's detected the intent based on that uh, training data we load in, which is uh, speak to sales. Now, that's not the exciting part here. The exciting part here, though, is actually when you come in and you change the text to something else. Right? So I don't know if folks in the room have noticed. Uh, I have a bit of an accent. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, in Philadelphia, we will say things like this, which is that I want to, we don't quite say things right, I want to chat with someone about messaging. So again, this is not even uh, English, right? So none of this was in our uh, training data. Uh, but it has the, the same idea that I want to talk to someone about messaging. Uh, and most of us in the room would understand what that means. Um, uh, with Twilio, uh, understand. Uh, now your applications can as well. And you'll see it comes back knowing that it wants to speak to someone in sales. Right? So it took basically uh, text that you know, could have, uh, you know, in the past, if you were doing string parsing or something like that, uh, you would have been misidentifying this. But now, with Twilio Understand, you can actually understand this. Cool. Cool. Great. So that's Understand. Voice, SMS, chat, and Alexa supporting on all the different modalities. So you can have understand work in a phone tree or an IVR. It can work in a message bot. Everywhere your customers talk to you, Twilio will understand. And understands uh, available in developer preview today. So I just gave you a brief rundown of some of our intelligence services. We talked about Copilot. We talked about understand. Uh, and we talked about our media engine. And all of those sit on top of our core communications APIs. But all of these services are running on top of something else. That's our super network. So allow me to invite up Christine Roberts, VP and GM of our super network. Thank you, Pat. As you know, the super network is the bridge between the slow-paced world of hardware-centric carriers and telecommunications providers and the fast-paced dynamic world of software and software developers. And all of these amazing APIs that Pat just talked about and the awesome apps that you develop sit and rely heavily on that underlying layer of connectivity that is the super network. It's important that it just works. And it's one of the many reasons that what you that many of the many reasons you build on Twilio. But along the way, we've discovered that the super network actually serves a bigger purpose. It's the super network's mission to catalog, orchestrate, and deliver the world's connectivity. And as a result, the super network is becoming the most highly sophisticated connectivity management system in the world. And that's because we in the super network approach the challenge of providing that connectivity with a very different approach than most traditional providers of that connectivity. We believe to understand and conquer the world of telecommunications that we need to solve it with software. And we know that carriers will experience hiccups, whether it's due to hardware failures or human error or even Mother Nature. And we know that with software, we can adapt and grow and change and continuously innovate. 
But with a customer-first software approach in mind, we listened to you when you told us you needed more phone numbers in more countries. We developed systems that increased the speed and accuracy of our onboarding of phone numbers. We promised you at Signal San Francisco about four months ago that we'd have phone numbers in 100 countries. And hopefully you've heard by now, we did it. <laughs> We now cover over 90% of the world's GDP and over 6 billion people worldwide. And by the way, when we say we have phone numbers, we actually have them fully tested in stock and tested to the level of quality that you're used to getting from Twilio. It's a pretty nice coverage map, don't you think? With a customer-first software approach mentality, we have listened to what you've said. We provided that depth of connectivity. But in the process of creating and perfecting the software that identifies all the characteristics of the millions of numbers we've tested over the years, we realized that just like phone numbers around the world have different capacity, different attributes, different regulatory requirements and reliability, your programmable communications also have different needs. Previously, we made sure that every single number we tested met any use case that that particular number could possibly carry. Take this phone number, for example. Looks pretty good, right? Inbound voice, outbound voice, retains DTMF, great audio quality, super clean. But guess what? It only happens one call at a time. It only handles one call at a time. And in the past, you all would never see that number. We would have tested it. We would have gone through the trouble to, to onboard it. But we said, you know what? No, it doesn't meet our high standard. But what you told us is you don't need every phone number to serve every single use case in the world. Say, for example, you're running a small business. And it just so happens your mom is the one answering the phone. And so your click to call app, the fact that that can only handle one call at a time, is maybe OK. You told us that you don't need every phone number to be perfectly curated for every use case. You just need it to be perfect for you. And in line with our mission of sharing our incredibly broad catalog of connectivity with you, yesterday we launched our Global Phone Numbers Catalog. With the Global Phone Numbers Catalog, you get instant access to the breadth and depth of our communications options that exist in our entire phone numbers inventory. Our API gives you a broader choice of phone numbers, a use case driven search, and access to the metadata that we have underlying every single number in our phone number inventory. Be sure to check out our new API, available officially in developer preview yesterday afternoon. But having an awesome catalog of global coverage isn't enough. Enemies of your apps are lurking everywhere whether it's lightning that takes out a server room or a backhoe that takes out a fiber cable. This just happened recently. <laughs> or, in the absolute worst case scenario, a dragon. The super network needs to be reliable, and it needs to be resilient. The super network continues to invest millions of dollars into monitoring and alerting using AI and machine learning and software design to identify the problems within the networks all around the world before you're affected. We actively monitor hundreds and hundreds of destinations for delivery issues, route failures, voice latency, traffic spikes, all the way down to the individual customer level. Early detection allows us to automatically route around issues. And the really cool thing is we continue to learn and evolve our monitoring, our alarming, and our resolution systems every single day to ensure that we can offer you world-class service and remove the complexities of the world of telco from your shoulders. At this point, we estimate that we're catching, rerouting, and resolving about 80% of the telco issues that happen constantly before our partners identify the problem, or even more importantly, before any of you feel the pain. All of this software-focused effort to catalog, orchestrate, and deliver the world's connectivity leads us to this, the ability to be flexible and agile. For me, as you can probably tell, that means never standing still. Moving quickly and adapting to the ever-changing environment and your ever-changing needs. That's one of the reasons I love it here at Twilio. 
We're constantly evaluating and innovating and changing and adapting. And being a software first company and a customer first team means that by definition, we're constantly improving. And the super network's continuing to improve our connectivity catalog and our reliability and resiliency every day for you. So you can feel confident that by building on Twilio, you'll get an ever-improving, ever-expanding catalog of the entire world's connectivity. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to offer up uh, back Jeff Lawson, one of my favorite dragon slayers. Thank you, Christine. Right, so we built this super network to connect up to all the phones in the world. And then we built the programmable communications cloud full of these communications APIs and intelligent services. And we put it in the hands of the world's developers and wanted to see what would happen. We wanted to see what y'all would build. And y'all got to work building amazing sets of applications. And see, when we talk to customers about the applications that you're building on top of Twilio, what we start to realize is that there's seems to be one thing on everybody's mind here. It turns out that customer engagement, creating a bridge between your company and your customers, is the common thread that is on almost everybody's mind. And see, as we look at the world of customer engagement that you are building, it always seems that like, there's all these applications, you can build anything, but three categories seem to define the world of customer engagement. I wanted to talk to you about those. The first category is a system to customer communication, right? That's where a program or a process wakes up and does some sort of automated communication with your customer. The second is department to customer. That's when a customer needs to talk to somebody on a team in your company, like sales or support. And then the third is individual to customer. That's where you need to enable a customer to talk to a specific person inside of your company, but it matters which person, right? And so you look at these three categories of engagement, and when you think about it, every single communication you've ever had with any company falls into one of these three categories. So let's dive in on these for a minute, if you will. Right? Because each one of these modes of engagement has actually a few key applications that drive how you're going to engage with your customers. See, in the system to customer category, it comes down to notifications and bots, are probably the biggest area we do that, right? And notifications are getting so much smarter all the time, having multiple modes of communication and things like that, and more timely alerts, and we get more notifications than ever, right, to help connect with the companies we do business with. And then, of course, we have bots, right? This promise that we'll be able to talk and solve many of our problems without human intervention, which is really promising. The second category, departments, well, that's typically what we think of as a contact center. But the thing is, contact centers are being transformed with the power of software, the power of customer context and knowing who the customer is and what they're up to to empower agents to provide great experiences faster than ever before. And then the last category, individual to, to a customer, well, that's getting completely transformed by mobility and mobile workforces. In fact, the nature of work has changed from employees sitting at a desk with a desk phone to people out in the field. Maybe there aren't even employees. They may be contractors. Right? And they've got their own phone, a BYOD device, not some desk phone that you would have had 10, 20 years ago. And so all three of these categories are getting transformed. And in aggregate, these three categories of engagement represent over 80% of the applications built on Twilio. So it makes sense that we would focus on this area and make it so you can get your applications built ever faster. And that's why we recently introduced the Engagement Cloud. It's the foundation of a new layer of Twilio that is helping you with new APIs to build and get to production ever faster with great customer engagement applications. Now, let me show you what this means. Let me show you what great engagement looks like. And I want to give you an example, actually, from a company that, that I'm a customer of, and so I've had this experience a number of times. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, um, if you look at some of the pictures of me around, um, I tend to wear the same thing a lot. In fact, this is a picture that I recently took of my closet. That, that's actually my closet. So it turns out that wearing the same thing pretty much every day uh, is more work than it seems. There's a lot of dry cleaning involved in my schedule. And 
So I used to take it to a store, but there's a service actually in San Francisco that'll come and pick up my dry cleaning and, and do the dry cleaning and deliver it back to me. It's really helpful. And in fact, they've instrumented the entire customer engagement flow on SMS. That's, the, that's how I interact with them. And it's really cool. So I wanted to share that with you because it actually demonstrates really nicely all three of these modes of engagement. So first thing is, when they've got a valet, someone who's going to come and, and pick up dry cleaning, in my neighborhood, I get a text message that morning. It says, we've got a valet who's going to be in your neighborhood uh, tonight. Reply with the letter Y if you want us to stop at your house. And about once a week, I reply with Y because I want them to come by. And a bot picks that up and says, great, and integrates with their system and says, we've scheduled the, the valet to come by your house tonight. Really cool. Now, sometimes I need them to come by on a day when they're not currently scheduled. And they will do this. I just reply to the last message I got. And I'd say something like, hey, can you come by tonight? I forgot to whatever. And that message is, well, it's not the letter Y, so the bot doesn't understand it. So they send it to their contact center. And someone who's staffed in the contact center reads that message and says, OK, I, we can help you. We scheduled a courier for, we scheduled a, a valet for tonight. They'll come by. It's a great experience. Because no matter what I text, no matter when I text it, I get a response right away. Whether it's a bot, whether it's a call center, perfect. And then when the valet is actually coming to pick up my stuff a few minutes before they arrive, I get a text message from them saying, I'm on my way. And it connects me to that mobile worker. And in this instance, these are actual screenshots from my interactions with them. Um, there was one day when I forgot that I'd asked him to come by and I wasn't home. Oops. And uh, I, I, he came by. I wasn't there. He left. And then I replied. I said, oh, I'm coming. And it went straight to him. And he said, oh, I can turn around and come back. Came back, picked up my dry cleaning. Right? So it's this really amazing experience. And what's really cool about it is that at every step of the way, I was connected with exactly the right person for the right moment in my experience with this company. And this is this pattern of great customer engagement that we see emerging. Smoothly integrating all of your systems with how you talk to your customers using the right channel that's right for the customer at the right time. That's this great pattern of engagement. Now, I wanted to chat with a few customers who are in the middle of the journey of building these types of engagement today. So we've got some awesome customers in the audience, and I wanted to hear more about what they've been building. So the first customer I wanted to chat with is Tom Mullen of Develop, who did that work with the NSPCC we heard about earlier. Uh, so please welcome up Tom. Give it up for Tom. So that was a really cool project. I was excited to induct you into the Hall of Doers. Congratulations. That's very kind. Unexpected. Yeah. So, so first of all, tell us a little bit about the Baby Steps program and, and how you got involved. Sure. Uh, so the Baby Steps program is run by the NSPCC. It, it aims to provide perinatal advice and support to hard-to-reach mums throughout the UK. Uh, it's really, really crucial for the kind of long-term outlook of a child's life that the help and advice is provide kind of pre- and post-birth, yet 75% of expected mums in low-income households in the UK don't receive any help at all. So the NSPCC are working extremely hard to bridge that gap with the Baby Steps program. And so uh, how did you get involved? Uh, it, it was rather serendipitous. Uh, my wife and I were days away from the arrival of our first child. C congratulations. Thank you. And I received a call from the Twilio team introducing me to the NSPCC. Uh, as you can imagine, it was a project that was very close to my heart at the time. And I thought that we could add real value, so I was very happy to get engaged and, and jump on in. Gotcha. So now they had uh, like certain ideas about how they wanted to do this, but they also had a lot of constraints on what they could do, given the personal nature of things. So what were some of the unique requirements of this project? Yeah, so there's two key constraints, really. One of those was uh, kind of regulation. The, the children's charity, so very heavily regulated, specifically around how they handle data, uh, and in this case, it's very sensitive data in, in uh, you know, the communications that they have between the expectant mums. So that was a big challenge. Uh, the second thing was that these hard-to-reach mums are, in fact, quite hard to reach. Uh, they don't often have access to email, and they often don't have smartphones. So that really narrowed down the channels of communication open to us through which we could talk to them on. So what did you build? Uh, there was two things that we, uh, that, that we built. Now, we understood that these hard-to-reach mums were four times more likely to engage via SMS than any other medium. So uh, with that in mind, we worked in close collaboration with uh, the NSPCC, Kathleen particularly, to kind of come up with two services. One of them was an automated messaging service. So for those of you who have kids, you've likely uh, subscribed to some kind of email service that will send you 
uh, an email on a weekly basis giving you an update and reassuring you about what's going on. The changes are very rapid. And it's, yeah, it's like the, your, your kid's the size of a peanut now, right. like those emails, yeah. Exactly. And you know, first time around specifically, it's all very new, all very confusing. Now, these hard to reach moms, they don't have access to these services. So we built a kind of text message equivalent that they could subscribe to and receive updates that were relevant to their stage of pregnancy, providing really kind of vital and reassuring information about what's going on, kind of the changes to their bodies. So, you know, really great service. Uh, the second part of it was, part of the Baby Steps campaign, they run group sessions. Now, the practitioners running these group sessions were having a very torrid time actually doing any of the admin around them. If they wanted to connect with uh, the, the expectant mums, they would have to log into their system, they would have to copy and paste the phone number, they'd have to send the message, subsequently delete the phone number because they weren't allowed to save it on the phone, and it became very, very laborious and actually made the whole process almost unworkable. So we built a kind of WhatsApp-style group messaging service on SMS alone, and what this allowed them to do is to create a group, have the expectant mum subscribe to it, and be able to communicate with each other without having to know any knowledge about the, the phone numbers and kind of remove all of that challenge of admin overhead uh, and increasing the kind of flexibility and fluidity of the communication. Wow, very cool solution. So how, how is it working? Where are you at? Uh, so the NSPCC have just conducted the first pilot and we're looking to roll the, the two uh, kind of solutions out across the UK over the coming weeks. So it should be very exciting and we're really help, hoping it makes a, a massive difference to those people who need it most. Fantastic. Let's hear it for Tom. Congratulations on both of your deliveries. Very, very cool. Two deliveries, a baby and your first application on Twilio all in like the same period of time. Uh, what a cool story. All right, next, uh, I want to meet a customer um, and hear a bit about their business. The, the, the company is simply business. And please welcome up uh, Lucas Oberhuber. Did I get that right? You did. Wow. Thank you. All right. Uh, please welcome Lucas from Simply Business. Let's hear it. Hello. So first of all, tell us about Simply Business. So I think very simply, we're uh, the UK's largest online insurance broker for small businesses. I got businesses. that. It took me a yeah. second. Yeah. Yeah, my jokes generally take a while. Uh, so, um, and uh, Un unlike uh, the code that counts. Exactly, unlike the code that counts. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So, so yeah, we're the UK's largest small insurance broker. We we insure architects, plumbers, uh, cleaners, pretty much anyone who's got a very small business, coders even. And so you've got a unique story in how you got started working with Twilio, and in particular, what you were looking for in your contact center. Can you, can you tell us that story? Yeah, so I, I guess we started with a contact center with a really bad phone system that wasn't working and needed to be replaced. And then the question was, what do we replace it with? So we were looking at an enterprise solution. Um, and you know, as we started working with it, we really didn't enjoy the process. And we also realized that you know, we have an outbound and an inbound um, part of our, our contact center. And a lot of the solutions were really focused on things like debt collection and lists that need to be called for a whole day. And we actually wanted to prioritize in real time, so we thought we'd be hacking into that. So that's where we came to Twilio, really. And so you realized it'd be, you'd be like hacking this thing up. It was never designed to be integrated. And so why did you decide to, to build? Um, well, first of all, we're a developer-first company, so we like mm -hmm. doing things. Um, we like building. Ask your developer. That doesn't mean we build everything, but things that matter to us a lot, we want to build, right? The things that we want to be flexible with, the things we want to try with, and what we really liked about Twilio was this API-first approach, which fit in perfectly with how we work. So that was one bit. And the second bit was we wanted to build a strategic platform that would work over time. So if you look at a lot of the legacy phone systems, they're just about thinking about multi-channel. And we just really wanted something that would last for a long time, would last globally, would work for us in all of those contexts. And there's this interesting story that I loved about a hackathon, in particular, where you came up with a bunch of new ideas. And the idea of the hackathon was not actually the developer's idea. Can you tell us the story? Yeah, so I mean, one of, one of the things that's really important about how we operate is the cultural side of things. And our contact centers 
those are the people who are the closest to our customers, actually. Um, it's not the rest of us, not developers, it's not me. And they wanted to do a hackathon based on Twilio and based on the phone system. And so we did that actually last July. And you know, ideas, the ideas were basically generated by the contact center consultants and, and what they thought would be most effective. And you know, they, they weren't super complicated ideas, but they were problems that actual customers were having. And so, so one of the ideas was, why don't we send an SMS if we fail to reach someone when we make a call to them? So, 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 so slow down and make sure you all got that, right? You had a hackathon, but the hackathon was driven not by the developers, by the call center agents. That's right. And they were the ones like embedding with developers and saying, here's these ideas and like, let's do it. And then they were driving that whole hackathon. Absolutely. That's so cool. And, and now if I understand this correctly, this wasn't just about technology. Um, your decision to build this call center was also about culture and how you're building the company and how you're building the culture on how you service your customers. Can you tell us? Yeah, I mean, so, so one of the things that uh, our CEO wanted to do is as we make our contact center more efficient, he wanted to give some of those gains back to our shareholders and some of those gains back to the employees. So, so one of our targets is to reduce the working week to four days rather than five days. So as, as we make our contact center more productive, we basically get done the same amount we would have done in five days with four days with our consultants taking the advantage of that and you know, any profitability uh, advantages coming out of that as well. And I think one of the things that, that on top of that, as we built out our Twilio-based solution, we've been able to make changes to how we work. So we didn't just replace what we had before, but so we've been able to replace incentive schemes, we've been able to change how teams operate, and that's been on the back of creating a better solution for both our consultants, for our customers, and for our developers, really. Wow, very cool. So happier agents, happier consultants, happier customers, everybody wins. Yes. What, and now, and you didn't even anticipate this originally, but now you're thinking about Omnichannel? Yeah, so, uh, so, so one of the things, that, and you know, one of the reasons we actually liked Twilio is that you guys were going to be, be innovating on top of what you've built already, and we wanted to be able to take advantage of that. And you know, as we start looking at what we're calling connected CRM and being able to communicate with customers in whatever medium they want to, which is pretty much you know, whatever it could be, um, that we want to be there for them in those, those mediums. You know, exactly as you, you, know, you described here, we want to be able to do notifications, chat bots, email, uh, phone. All of those are mediums. Uh, the web, of course, is one of the most important. Those are all mediums that our customers want to speak to us in, and we want to be there for them. And so really being able to weave that all together in a, a unified way is super important for the future for us. So it's like a future-proofed investment, essentially, that you didn't even anticipate when you started that you needed all these channels, but you listen to customers and you realize that yeah. if you're going to follow your customers, they're going to take you into all these new areas. And uh, you had some interesting news recently. Yeah, so we've been moving into the U.S. since we, we were acquired by travelers, yeah, um, yeah. as I had mentioned, uh, for, for a, a half a unicorn. Um, and uh, Which half? The, the back small, or the, the front? Yeah. It's hard to say. It's, it's, you, you have to spin around just to like figure all it the out. interesting unicorn things are on the front. Yeah, so exactly. Let's just leave it at okay. That. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> um, now, and, and then secondarily to that, at the same time, we've been moving into the U.S. and, and starting a business out there, and we're really excited about being able to bring the Twilio platform we've built, as well as the rest of our platform, into the U.S. market. Where it turns out the customer problem is very similar. So even though the regulatory side, the insurance side is very different, what customers need is very similar. And you built it once and it works anywhere in the globe. Yep. Very cool. Awesome story. Congratulations. And uh, good luck uh, with your uh, long weekends. And I hope you uh, hit that goal. Let's hear it for Lucas and Simply Business. Thank you very much. Congratulations. And uh, one more customer I want to meet who's doing some really interesting stuff. They're disrupting the process of getting financing for a new car. Please welcome up John Wilson from Car Finance 24-7. John, come on up. Thanks, Jeff. Welcome. So first of all, tell us uh, so the quick story. Car Finance 24-7, what are you up to? Yeah, so we're, uh, we're attempting and succeeding, hopefully, in disrupting a traditional model where um, customers will typically get uh, financed when buying the next used car at a point of sale. Which is, which is difficult for the customer, it's, it's awkward, it's a pressurized environment. It's not a particularly good deal. Yeah, not, in most cases it's not a good deal. So, <laughs> so we're, we're flipping that on its head and allowing customers to get approved um, online, get the best deal, we search the market and then putting them in control when they enter the dealership. 
And so what were you dealing with before you started uh, working with Tulia? Uh, very similar to how Lucas describes really from Simply Business, you know, on-premise, legacy phone system, uh, very frustrating. We only had a small team of developers at the time, but it was a black box environment. We couldn't maintain it, we couldn't fix it, we couldn't improve it. Um, so it was quite obvious, we were, we were scaling at the time, you know, we could see the company was going through some growth. Uh, 60 agents a couple of years ago, uh, the company was only 80 people I think at the time. Yeah, so it's uh, like so most of the company of the was on, this, yeah. on the phone and so we, need, we needed to address that, that key problem. So what did you do? Uh, well, we, uh, we set about replacing the phone system. So, you know, you look, you look around at the market and you start looking at the very similar solutions. Uh, we stumbled upon Twilio. Um, um, almost by accident, really. Um, within a couple of days, a couple of lines of code, you can make a phone ring. And at that point, you go, well, we don't need these providers. Let's, let's do it ourselves. Um, so really, within a couple of weeks, proof of concepts, a few more weeks, we had a team of eight agents on the phone. Um, and then at the time, we, I think we grew the engineering team to six, seven developers. And within two or three months, we'd replaced our on-premise uh, phone solution with, with, with our first major um, iteration of Twilio, which was to replace voice. So that's really cool. It's that iterative spirit of software, right? Let's yeah. see if we can try it, working, working, like just keep building, and keep building, keep building. Listen to your customers, build something better. I love that story. So what's the result of of investing in and building out this this uh, this infrastructure. Well, at the time, um, so we, we want to truly scale. The business is now 450 people. Where we've got around 220 agents on the phone, uh, but to truly scale as a business, we we want the customer to do more. So we're on a journey around allowing the customers to select their car in an authenticated members area. Um, they can quote themselves, and we're going to be doing more and more to allow the customer to self-serve and self-fulfill. Um, but customers love talking with us, or as we found out, they love communicating with us, and we very much want the, the agents to, to handhold them through that process. Um, so we're, we're, even today, we're incredibly inefficient at, at allowing, uh, at converting those customers. We have lots of customers searching for cars, but when we outbound to them by voice, we just don't seem to get hold of them. Um, so naturally, we wanted to, and today, we, we, we now have an omnichannel contact center. So agents uh, using Sync, we, we know when um, customers are logged in, looking at cars, we know what they're doing. Uh, the agents can then reach out to them by chat in the app, or, or after they've left the, the environment, they can then two-way SMS, and, and of course, voice as well. With a full context of everything that they're doing, what they're looking for, and being able to reach out and being really helpful because the agent is just in the know. Yeah, exactly. So the agent can enter a meaningful conversation straight away. All right, I can see you're looking at this Ford Focus. Would you like me to give you a quote on that? Uh, four years, five years, whatever it might be. Exactly. Wow, really cool. And you had an interesting business result because of this. Uh, yeah, uh, a huge, a huge impact. So uh, we had an 85% reduction in that initial contact time. So we, we were speaking to customers uh, by different means, really high up the funnel and, and leading to more meaningful voice conversations. 85% reduction in the amount of time to make the first contact that, with the customer. That first contact, yeah. Wow, that is really cool. So not only did you address your initial issues with making voice better, yep. you kept building, adding more channels, more context, and now you have this meaningful engagement with your customers at every step of the way and reducing your time to connect by 85%. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome story. Let's hear it for John and Car Finance 24 7. Thank you, Jeff. Cheers. Thanks for joining us. That's really cool. So, you know what? Like, there's all these things that you can build, and you start, as we, as we heard, you get started with one line of code. Every project, every piece of software ever built started with a line of code. But it's sort of interesting when you think about the journey that you go on as a developer and start building, and oftentimes you don't even realize what you're getting into when you get started. And that's why we've been investing in some new services at Twilio to make sure that you get to, to production as quickly as possible. Take notifications, for example. A lot of developers, a lot of companies start by building notifications. And you think, OK, this is going to be easy. I'm going to you know, wire up to an SMS API, and I'm going to send a notification. You know, that'll be easy. And indeed, sending the initial SMS is easy. But what you don't realize is that as soon as you start doing those notifications to customers, you start getting new requirements from customers. And you figure out, oh, there's these new channels that customers want. Email, push notifications. You say, OK, I'm going to go find, to find some APIs to go do that, integrate those new channels. And as soon as you got that done, you say, great, I'm done. Maybe I can go on my four-day uh, weekend. Oh, hold on. 
there's new ones that just came out. You got Facebook Messenger, you got Alexa, and the list of places where you might need to notify your customer keeps on growing. And it's not just finding the APIs to integrate those mediums, it's also then the orchestration layer. Okay, so for which customer do I send which type of notification? And you realize there's a whole set of complex business logic just to figure out how to reach each customer effectively. And we saw this pattern playing out time and time again at our customers, and so we said, why isn't there an API that just does this for you? And so we built one. It's called Notify. And so if you integrate with Notify, you get SMS, of course, but you also get all those other channels. We're adding more all the time. And you get that orchestration logic that figures out, OK, for which customer, which channel should we use? And so it's really powerful. And our idea here is that if you integrate with Notify, it sort of future-proofs that code investment. Because as new channels come online, you can plug them in and get started without having to rewrite your application. It's really powerful. And we saw a similar thing happen with two-factor authentication. Well, a lot of customers of Twilio uh, started adding two-factor authentication to their apps. What is that? It's when you log into you know, a website or a mobile app, and it says, hey, to make sure you know, you're actually who you say you are, we sent you a, a six-digit pin, enter it here to verify your identity, two-factor authentication. And again, a lot of uh, companies say, OK, this is, you know, this is not too hard. I'll generate a random code, and I'll send an SMS. You wire it up to our SMS API. And that's where it starts. But then you realize, oh, wait, some customers want a different way to authenticate, like a one-time password, TOTP. Some customers want to push notification to a mobile app to verify their identity. They say, OK, well, let's, let's find some, some APIs to integrate those things. Then you realize it's not just the notification channels. It's actually the business processes around two-factor authentication. Things like, how do I reset a, a customer's uh, phone number if they change their phone number? Now they're locked out of their account. Or how do I securely store their TOTP keys? Or how do I make this a great and secure user experience? And you realize you started down this path and you even think about all these things. And so we said, how can we make it so that if you want two-factor authentication, you don't have to go figure that all out for yourself? And so now we have Authy. Two-factor authentication and identity verification APIs that take care of all that for you. You integrate it once. And then as the ways in which you do two-factor authentication evolve, like having new mediums come online, but also you get the benefit of all the best practices. All those business processes are built in. So you didn't have to, as a developer, go and start figuring out all that stuff, which is not really what you thought you were signing up for when you got started saying, I'll just send you a text message. So it's really cool. And so that's what we've been seeing in that area of notifications and bots. Well, what about the contact center? You know, we just heard some stories about some really awesome contact center projects allowing engagement with customers. And as the story goes, every contact center seems to start with this idea, oh, let me just make the phone ring. Right? That's easy. Right? And, and then you start building out from there. But pretty quickly, you realize beyond the prototype, when you actually start scaling it up to agents, you need to actually figure out, well, which of the agents is going to get this call? And you realize you have to figure out things like skills-based routing. Right? Which agent knows about the product that the customer is calling about? Or which, customer, which uh, agent speaks the same language as the person who's calling? But that's not all. You also figure out agent presence. Which agent is online and available to take the call right now and not busy? Not on another call. Didn't run to the bathroom. Then you figure out, well, reporting. The person who's running the call center, they want some reporting, and they want agent uh, workforce scheduling. Right? So there's all these other things that you need beyond just making the phone ring. And you didn't think about that necessarily up front. And we wanted to make it so that every developer who's building a contact center doesn't have to think about these things. They're just built in. And so we built TaskRouter. It's an API. You can plug in to your call center, and it does all that stuff for you. So figuring out how to route every call is just built in. And you don't have to go reinvent the wheel figuring out what are the best practices about how to route calls. We've got that with TaskRouter. So that's the contact center. What about this area of the mobile worker? Right? It's an interesting category. See, an increasing number of companies are finding themselves struggling with a brand new problem that didn't exist 10 years ago. See, you've got these mobile workers, and they've got their own device, a cell phone, their own mobile phone. And you want to let them talk to your customers because they need to engage in order to actually complete a transaction or to build a, great, uh, build a great experience. They need to talk to each other. But the thing is, if you let them talk directly to each other, you have to worry about all sorts of things. You have to worry about them you know, exchanging maybe a credit card and taking a transaction offline, cutting out your business. You have to worry about them, uh, I don't know, exchanging profanity or maybe one of them calling the other one at 3 AM after they've been doing a little drinking. Right? There's a lot of things that can go wrong here when you enable your mobile workforce to talk directly to your customers on their personal phones. Um, and so this is a problem that needs solving. 
And it's interesting is this problem comes about because of the fact that your employees are no longer just sitting at a desk using your company PBX. They're out in the world. They may not even be employees anymore. And they're using their own phones. And so we've got a customer who's actually been solving a problem uh, just like this and building an awesome business while they've been doing it. And that customer is John Lewis. And with the launch of their new home solutions business earlier this year, they've been building uh, just this use case. So we want to learn more about that. Please welcome up Richard Ambler from John Lewis. Richard, come on up. <laughs> welcome, Richard. Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? Very good. Great to have you here. So, uh, Thanks for the dress code. You know, so yeah, do, I, do you want a vest? I can go yeah, get one Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. I've got like 12 more. Yeah, yeah, lovely. In my hotel. Yeah, okay. So uh, first of all, congratulations on the successful so rollout much. of Home Solutions. That was pretty recent, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, we, uh, we went with a pretty soft launch um, in May in, uh, in one area just to sort of test some demand. But we've been really empowered by the results. So, uh, you know, we're now, uh, we're now looking to scale and uh, getting on with it. Fantastic. So tell us a bit about Home Solutions, what it is, and why John Lewis decided to go in this direction. Sure. So um, as I'm sure most people here know, John Lewis is a, is a retailer. We sell stuff. But customers are uh, increasingly saying to us, how can you help us do more stuff beyond just product? Um, and, uh, and one particular pain point that they've talked about is getting stuff done in their home. And uh, you know the sort of the trades market is uh, is a market that's characterised by variable standards and a bit of a lack of trust. We're a retailer that uh, that people or a brand that customers have a lot of trust in, um, and so we've uh, we've started to develop a solution about um, you know connecting our customers with really high quality vetted trades um, so that they can get jobs done in their home. So tradespeople, what kind of tradespeople? Look, it's, uh, it's plumbers, it's electricians, it's painters and decorators, it's carpenters, it's landscapers, it's plasterers. You know, it's a whole gamut of everything you can want to do in your home. We've got it covered for you. So it's like the very definition of the mobile workforce I just talked about, right? These are professionals that are out there in the field. They, they don't work for you, right? These for are, sure. these are uh, you know, trades, uh, tradesmen. Yeah. And so it's the very definition of that mobile workforce I was just talking about. So like, how, do you, how did you think about the communication between those tradespeople, those professionals, and your customers? And what, did, what role did communications play in that interaction? Sure. So I, I think you articulated it really well. Um, you know, because the, um, when I think about it, there are, sort of, there are three of us in this relationship. You know, there's the customer. Uh, that's the tradesperson who, as you say, is not employed by John Lewis, and there's John Lewis. And there are times where what we want to do is we just want to connect the customer with the tradesperson, but we want to do that in a, in a way that's really sort of secure and really safe and fe feels really on brand for us. But then there are also times where we want to be part of that conversation, and so there are conversations going on between us and the customer, or indeed us and the tradesperson. And what Twilio has enabled us to do is to curate that experience depending on what stage of the journey the customer is at or indeed the tradesperson is at so that actually with simple taps of buttons in our applications then actually we're connecting the right two or three people um, together in each experience. Hmm. And then you protect yourself against things that could go wrong when you enable that, right? Sure. Um, so, you, you know, on the business side, we, uh, we protect ourselves against disintermediation, but also on the customer side, you know, and on the tradesperson side, there may be really good reasons why they don't want to have each other's numbers. And so we use the, uh, the mass calling uh, and SMS uh, functionality uh, within, uh, within the product. Um, and that just means that it feels really sort of, you know, reassuring to the customer. And we make quite a big point around that, around, you know, we've gone out and we've vetted these really great people, but we We've got your security, you know, right, right at the heart of the product. Yeah, your privacy is in mind here sure. in this product, sure. right? So that's the uh, tradesperson to customer communications, and you must have a call center too. Uh, we do, um, although it's tiny. Um, so we have three people. Um, in our, our call center. Just getting you know, started. We, we, uh, you know, uh, partly because we're just getting started, but also partly because we believe that we can solve a lot of this with technology. Yes, there are times where a customer wants to speak to a person, but also, you, you know, one of the most interesting things that we've seen is the number of bookings that are happening between 10 o'clock at night and 6 o'clock in the morning is unbelievable. People are, you know, arranging to have their room painted, you know, at 3 in the morning, you know, their boiler service at, you know, 2 at night or, or whatever it might be. And so actually, you know, we believe that if you, uh, if you, um, make this really convenient for customers, then you, you know what? We don't need to be there providing people all of the time in this. You know, technology can solve it for us. And speaking of technology, you're also, you've got notifications and bots. You've just started exploring that part of the customer engagement. Sure. We're in the, uh, the, the really sort of um, early days of that, but, you know, we think it's got great potential for us. And, you know, we definitely see the, uh, the opportunity to help really refine and understand um, a customer's problem so that we can connect them with the right tradesperson. You know, bots have definitely got a, a a role to play in that, that we can really sort of, you know, refine and, and, and narrow down what it is that customer wants to be done so that ultimately we can provide the right person to them in the most seamless way. Awesome. What's next for home services? 
so, so look, um, what we're building is, um, you know, the start of a really big business, we believe. You know, something that can sort of take us more fully into the customer's home. So, look, we're going to go into more areas um, geographically. We're going to go into uh, to more propositions. And, look, the product backlog, you know, as I'm sure everybody here will recognise, is, uh, you know, enormous. There is so much more that we can do. We've really only scratched the uh, surface. Well, we're going to help you accelerate that roadmap. Let's hear it for Richard Ambler of John Lewis. Congratulations on the launch of Home Solutions. Thanks, Jeff. Thank Cheers. you. Very cool. So you see this, this model, right? Just as Richard talked about, right? You've got a mobile worker, you've got a customer, and you've got this communications that you need some sort of proxy in the middle of in order to make sure that nothing goes wrong. And so we saw many customers needing this type of solution, and so we built it. We call it Twilio Proxy, and it does just that. It's a proxy that sits between two parties in a session and does all sorts of cool things. First of all, it manages all the phone numbers so that you, know, you don't have to go figure out how to manage your own phone number inventory to make sure you've got a phone number that you can give out to each party that allows them to connect independently to each other. Uh, and then once you've got that phone number sitting in the middle between the two as your proxy, you can do interesting things. Like you can do content filtering and redact out you know, a credit card number or profanity or all sorts of other things. And it's all configurable once you have that proxy sitting in the middle. Now, I want to show you the code for this really quickly. Um, because I want to point out something. So this is a simple code that you use to create a session. You just basically give it the phone numbers of the two participants in this, uh, in this proxied session. And then what uh, proxy gives back to you is your proxy identifier. This is the virtual number that you're going to go give to both of those parties that enable them to talk to each other. And it takes care of the routing for you, as well as optional filtering that you can configure in there. It does all of it for you. So it's like one line of code. But this line of code is very different than a line of code, for example, to send a text message. Because if you think about the line of code you might write to send a text message to from body, it's very imperative. You tell us what to do. But with this API, instead of telling us what to do, you're telling us your intent. What is your application trying to accomplish? And then we can take care of the heavy lifting to get that done for you. And it's a different way. It's a different kind of API. We're calling it declarative APIs. Because by telling us the intent, we can now build this service and make it better for you every day because we know the intent. We know what you're trying to accomplish. And so as we learn more about that use case, as we learn more about best practices, or best practices actually evolve, we can implement, implement that in the product, and then you get the benefit of it without having to do anything, without having to write more code, without having more story points or adding more sprints. You get all that for free. And so that's the value of declarative APIs. You get the value of our development resources just added straight onto your roadmap and the value of all the best practices that we've learned from working with as many developers as we have. Right? And that's the basis of this new layer of Twilio, the engagement cloud. Declarative APIs that take these common applications that we see so many customers wanting to build, and we're asking ourselves, how can we accelerate your roadmap of building great engagement with your customer? So at the end of the day, what do you do? You write the code that counts. And let us write all sorts of other things that accelerate your development, and you take that piece, that magic, that special sauce, the integration into all of your other systems, and the thing that makes your customer experience unique to you, you write that part. That's the code that counts. And let us do all the heavy lifting for you to help you get there faster. And with the engagement cloud, it leads us to think about Twilio in a new way. See, we're not just the company that helps your apps communicate, which we do. But at the end of the day, the result of all that is we're the company that helps you engage with your customers better. And that's what it's all about. See, it's a partnership between your code and your creativity and our APIs that accelerate your roadmap that help you build that great customer experience. And that's what Ask Your Developer is all about, that partnership, which sounds great. But there's one problem if you're the developer. Ask your developer. The problem is, for some reason, people keep asking you for stuff. <laughs> right? It's not just like the big ideas that people are coming to you with. Right? It's the minutia. It's the small changes, the tweaks. Hey, change the copy here. Right? And the worst words from your product manager, it always happens at like the very end of the day when you're packing up. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if the product did this? How soon can I have that? 
right? And developers are getting a little tired of people asking them for stuff. So what do we do? We put on ever-increasingly large headphones. <laughs> Leave me alone. Stop asking me for stuff. The reason why is that building is exciting, but maintaining is not, right? But that's maintaining is a fact of life if you write code. In fact, it's a common pattern that we see in the history of computation, the history of software, that we keep solving this problem. Right? Think about websites. Right? In the 90s, when the web was brand new, every website was built by hand by developers. In fact, I went into the Wayback Machine, and I found the very first website that I ever built for a customer, tiskittasket.com. Copyright 1998. Beautiful, isn't it? Right? And the thing is, I delivered this to a client in the town where I grew up, and the client was really happy, and then they kept coming back to me. They said, oh, can you change the text here? Can you add a new image there? Can you add a new type of basket? I mean, what the hell is a sports nut basket anyway? Right? And they kept asking me for all this stuff. It gets kind of annoying. But you know what? We're software developers. We're tool builders. So what did we all do? We went and built tools. Right? We built software to empower people to actually take websites into their own hands and keep building these applications without having to have the developer do all the work. We empower the business to build their own websites. What is that? It's a content management system. Right? That's what we came up with as our tool. Right? It allowed developers to set up the website, right? design the front end, design the back end, do some integrations with databases, right? but then hand it off to other people to make the copy changes or upload the images, take over the day-to-day -day tasks. And this accelerated the development of websites substantially because it opened up a whole new set of users to build and operate these web applications. Right? We saw this pattern emerge again just in the area of general computation. Right? If you think back to the very earliest days of computers, everything that a computer did was written in code. Right? So if you wanted to do, I don't know, financial modeling for a company, a developer would have to write a program in order to crunch the numbers and do some sort of basic computation. But we're software developers. We like to empower people. We build tools. And so what do we do? We invented the spreadsheet. Right? And we took a lot of the tasks of mundane computation, right? financial planning and modeling and compensation, whatever, right? and we put it in the hands of other people inside the organization. Right? And we let many more people who maybe weren't developers, who were very technically minded, be able to run these sort of computations. So that the developers are freed up to work on more interesting problems. And having computation in the hands of so many more people inside the organization was a big accelerant to business. And do you know what the most popular IDE in the world now is? Microsoft Excel. A billion users in the world. Right? So we started asking ourselves at Twilio some questions. We said, well, you know, what if creating customer engagement was as easy as building a website with a CMS? Right? What if the whole team was able to contribute to building your customer engagement roadmap? You know, when we started Twilio, we observed that there were something like 20,000 certified telecom professionals who were able to like, build these applications, really knew the guts of telecom. And we had this vision. We wanted to open it up to the 20 million software developers of the world. But maybe that wasn't big enough. What if there's a billion people who are able to contribute to these engagement roadmaps? What if we could help you accelerate your roadmap for customer engagement by letting more and more people collaborate on these applications? So today, I'm excited to announce Twilio's newest product, Twilio. Studio that does just that. It's a visual builder. It's a, our goal here is to massively accelerate your roadmaps. So all the things that you want to build, that you've got planned out sprint after sprint, we want to accelerate that whole roadmap and make it faster than ever for you to build all that stuff. And what's really cool is that it lets developers focus on the key building blocks the key integrations, the key database stuff. But it frees you up from having to do things like the copy changes and the tweaks to the flows and all this kind of stuff. Ultimately, it lets you get more done faster. Now, let me show it to you. This is what it looks like. It's got a canvas and all these widgets that lets you do a lot of uh, interesting things. 
right? So first of all, I'm going to zoom in here and show you where it starts. So I'm going to point out here that it's multimodal. So it works not just for calls, but for messaging too. You can also trigger these things via the REST API, right? And then you can do all sorts of interesting things, right? And it's not just SMS when I say messaging. It's also all the other channels that Twilio has integrated, like Facebook Messenger automatically work out of the box with this thing as well, right? So let's keep looking around, right? You scroll down here, you'll see uh, this interesting, uh, you'll see this interesting thing here, the Boolean logic. Like, think about building an if-else statement, right? Like, you have to build out a whole controller model just to get to a basic Boolean, that's easy. The simple things that a developer does all day, every day, like, that's easy, it's just, it's just done, right? Now you can focus on more interesting things. Look at this part. Templates. So the content of your messages, whether it's uh, you know the voice uh, IVR, whether it's an SMS bot or something like that, these are all templates now. So you set it up once, and you can do variable substitutions and all this stuff. But then other people can go back in and change those templates over time. If you say, oh, you know what? Let's say this. Let's say that. Let's tweak it. Let's run an A/B test. Right? Someone else can go in and tweak the content. And the other thing, of course, is that it is fully extensible. Because we realize that no drag and drop editor will ever be able to do absolutely everything a developer might do. So every part of this is extensible with code. You can run functions on top of the Twilio runtime. You can run webhooks that run on your own server. Every part of this is extensible by developers. Right? So that's the canvas view. But you know what else? It doesn't just look pretty, but it also has performance under the hood where it matters. Because it's built on top of the Twilio runtime. So that means. You drag and drop, and it's nice and easy, but it also auto-scales for you. It's got security built in. It's got ISO 27001 certification, high availability. All of these things are running under the hood so that you just drag and drop, and you never have to worry about scaling security or any of that other ops stuff. So it's quite a package, right? It accelerates your development, lets the whole team collaborate on building these engagement applications. It's multimodal. It works across every form of communication and there's no ops requirements whatsoever. It just works magically. So this is in preview today. Toyota.com slash studio is where you can learn more. Now, uh, I can keep talking about this, but you know what I'd rather do is I'd rather show it to you. So let's do a demo. Please welcome up the product lead for Twilio Studio, Ben Stein. Ben, come on up. Hey, Jeff. All right, Ben. W welcome up here. So, you know, the best way to uh, to get a sense of any Twilio product is to just uh, is just to get hands on it. We love doing live demos, so we're just going to do it live here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as as you're logging in and getting that set up, I mean, I think there's a number of things to to see about uh, Twilio Studio that just by playing around with it, like we've been using it internally now a little bit, and as we've played around with it, we've just been blown away by how easy it is to to, to do some common things. So, Ben, give us a quick tour of what's going on. Thanks, Jeff. I'm really excited to demonstrate Twilio Studio for you today. What we're going to do is we're going to build an IVR, a phone tree, like the experience that someone would have if they called Twilio. So we're going to start this flow right here uh, with an incoming call. And the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to greet the caller. So I'm going to drag in a Say widget, Say Play, so you can play an audio file or you can use our text-to-speech engine. Uh, we're going to connect a transition, so when that call comes in, the first thing that happens is we're going to say that message. I will type it in right here. Hello. Welcome to Twilio. There we have it. It's saved. And it's the first step in the, uh, the call experience. Next cool, up. Nah. Nah. What if you want to like, you know, sales or service, something like that? Like a, like a sure. Again, yeah, IVR. Uh, typical IVR, right? Press 1 for sales, 2 for support. Let's do it. So I'm going to drag in a gather widget. This will gather the user's input. And we'll connect it up after they hear the welcome to Twilio. We will gather and press 1 for sales, press 2 for support. Right, we've all had this experience. Perfect. And then after the user presses a key, zoom in a little bit, we want to split this flow. Right, we'll split it based on one or two. So I'm going to drag in a split, the transition after that key press. And now we're going we're to check a variable. We're going to check what key the user pressed, and we're going to branch based on that digit. So right here, we'll choose we're going to test the digit. We're going to set up a few new custom transitions. We'll transition if the digit equals 1. 
Well, then we want to connect the call to sales. So we can just drop in a connect call widget. It will wire it up for us. Very cool. And if the user presses two, well, we can do that as well. We drop in a new condition, two, and we will connect this call to support. There we go. Now, Jeff, this is going to take me two or three more minutes to build the full experience. There's a lot of features of Studio. So what I'd like to do is jump ahead just two or three widgets, and I'll show you what a completed IVR is going to look like. All right, let's do it, yeah. Let's close this tab. And here we have a complete IVR built on top of Studio. You can see the things that we just uh, dragged in, one for sales, two for support. It uh, connects down to the right departments. And I dropped in some error handling as well. So if a user keys in a number that wasn't expected, uh, we'll, we'll say, sorry, I didn't understand that. So now the, the title of this is uh, Twilio London Office IVR. Right, is, that, is that real? That's real. So what we did is we connected all the Twilio phone numbers to Studio. So now if you were to call Twilio right now, you would have this exact experience. So let's check it out. So this is our, our company website. Uh, and here's all the contact information. Scroll down to our London office. You can see right here. Here's our phone number, and so we're going to give it a shot. And jump over. Very good. There's my iPhone. And here we have the Twilio London office as the number we just showed. We'll give it a call. I'll jump back to that workflow so you can see what it looks like. Welcome to Twilio. Press 1 for sales. Press 2 for support. Welcome. You have reached Twilio sales. All right. Please leave a okay. message. Yeah. Okay, well, pretty basic. All right, very cool. Okay, so so that's a you know that's a pretty straightforward IVR. But you know what I want to know is we launched just a few months ago a voice recognition and 130 languages and natural language understanding. Can we actually add voice recognition to our IVR now? Can we do that in like two minutes? Let's do it. Studio is the easiest way to adopt new, new products and new features into your customer experience and your, your customer engagement. So let's zoom in right here. And you'll see there's one gray transition that we haven't wired up yet. And this is when a user says something. And what we want to do is we want to drag in understand so we can understand what someone says when they talk into the, uh, the, the phone tree. So I'm going to drag in an understand widget. And I'll wire it up. So as soon as we detect that someone is speaking, we're going to pass it into understand. And uh, Pat earlier trained a model based on sales and support. So we're going to reuse that model that he just trained, drop in the, the SID of that uh, model. And this time, instead of uh, branching on the digits, we're going to branch on the speech result, on the audio that the uh, user spoke. Great. And if we get an intent, then we're going to set up a new transition. And if the intent is found, then we want to split that flow. One and thing we, that I really like about Studio is how like, the type ahead works. So like, as you just start typing, as, as you get into these flows, you know, it gets complex. And instead of having to pan around all the time, you've got a nice uh, panel over here with the type ahead that actually finds the widget you're looking for, even the variable name you're looking for. It's all built in. It's really easy to use. Great. So let's take this split. And we're going to split the flow, again, just as we did before. And this time, we're going to split based on the intent. And we'll set up our transitions. And the model that we trained earlier uh, had a, a two choices. One, if you wanted to get help. And if we detect that intent, then we're going to transition to the support line. We'll save that. And it's so cool. If you notice, uh, Ben, drag something around for a second. Here, so, it, right? so every time you make changes, it saves. It auto saves for you, so you don't have to really worry about it. There you go. And you get a revision number. So every time you make a change, you actually get your full reversion history is, uh, is saved here so that you can always uh, you know, be able to go back and things like that later. And if I Every want developer to asks about that feature, by the way. It's in the top of all of our minds, isn't it? And does it talk to sales or speak to sales? I think it's talk to sales. Then we're going to transition to sales. Perfect. Is why, uh, conditions get, these transitions get wired up. And we'll also drop in some error handling. So if there is no matches, we didn't quite know what they meant, or we didn't get an intent, it's actually a great experience. So we'll drop in that error handling right there. And actually, Jeff, I think we're done. So let's, so All let's right. Give it a shot. Let's call it.
Welcome to Twilio. Press I want one for sale. With my application. I can see you are looking for help. You have reached Twilio support. Please no! leave a message after the tone. So you know what else is really cool about this, right? If you're a developer, you've ever taken over a project from like another developer, like you know, you have to read their code, it takes a while, you got your head in the space, but it's like it's self-documenting, right? You just see the flow of things visually, and it's actually really cool. It's so easy to read someone a, a flow that you've never seen before and very quickly figure out what's going on. Um, I love that about this. So now I get a question, but so we did the a call in voice recognition, but the kids today, they're texting. The kids are right? texting. Uh, so this is a multimodal uh, uh, editor. Let's build in what happens if you were to text Twilio's phone number, because uh, UK geo numbers are textable on Twilio, and so we can actually wire this up to handle text messages as well. Let's do it. So if you look at this trigger, you can see a flow can be triggered by an incoming message. So what we're going to do is just drag in a message. So as soon as we get an incoming message to our Twilio number, then we can send a response. Welcome to Twilio. And save, and we're done. So now our Twilio uh, UK office number can accept text messages. That was awesome. That. That, was, that was cool, right? All right, cool. What if, so, so if any of you have gone to Twilio.com slash studio, you see there's actually a, a spot if you sign up for early access, there's a, a code that actually helps you get to the front of the line for early access to studio. We want to give a code to all of you. So that for being here today, you get first dibs at access to studio. Let's make it so they can text in in order to get their code. Let's do it. Sounds good? Yep. Although okay. what I want to do is, is put some sort of password on it, right? So that, oh, anyone yeah. so that who anybody texts, who texts right? our number doesn't get, OK, great. Let's put right, a password. So we're going to password, and we'll, we'll just share it with, with this room right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to split this flow based on what all of you text in. So I'll drag in this split widget up here. and. We are going to test the body of the message that came in from that incoming message trigger. And if it matches the password, you'll get a code. And if there's no match, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go uh, right back to that welcome to Twilio message. So we drop this split right in between. So first we will uh, move the screen over a little bit. First we'll test the body. Then we'll send that welcome message. And if they do text the uh, password, so we'll drop in a new uh, code here. And it's actually pretty neat. You can do all sorts of testing, equals, regular expressions. But let's just drop in a password. And I think the signals. So we have password. How about uh, rusty monkey spatula trombone? All right. So rusty monkey spatula trombone. Perfect. OK. So <laughs> sorry, Jeff. Let's just, let's just do signal. All right. So if folks text in signal to our office number, well, so now, we get, now it gets to a sort of a tricky spot, right? We didn't quite build in the send super secret yeah, passcode where, where, widget. Where's right? the, yeah, no, I, the widget I didn't for quite. secret passcode? Yeah. So, so whenever you reach a limitation in Studio, we designed it with developers and extensibility in mind. So it's super easy to drop in a Twilio function or call out to your web server to extend the functionality of Studio for any problem you're trying to solve. So, so in this it, case, so. if they text in, if all of you text in, the uh, signal code, we're going to run a function to give you that code back. And since Studio is inherently uh, for cross-functional teams, allowing everyone in a company to contribute to the, the roadmap, I'll do the dragging. Why don't you do the coding? Great. All right, so let's build a function now. Thank you, Ben. So, all right, so now we go back to, to Twilio. You can see it's got that nice full screen toggle. You get full screen, and then we can go back here. Now we're going to go to the uh, Twilio uh, runtime. I'll open this up in a new tab. And so we go to the runtime. You see this is where functions live. We also have this thing, uh, assets. You can actually upload static assets that are useful in, in websites. So I'm going to do that because we've got a, a CSV, a spreadsheet of secret codes that we generated that, uh, that are valid to give you, uh, give you early access, right? So we're going to add an asset. We've got codes.txt. We're going to upload that. Uploading asset, great. Now we've got codes at TXT hosted on Twilio's runtime. Now we're going to go over to functions, and we're going to create a new function. So we've got all these templates you can start from. For this one, we're actually going to start with a JSON response template, which just basically runs some node and returns JSON. We're going to give it a name. Let's call it you know, secret code generator. 
And here's the code. Your code goes here. Great. How easy. So uh, now we'll start writing some code. So first of all, I'm going to get the path uh, to that asset we just uploaded. So let path equal, we're going to use the new runtime uh, client library that, that runs. It gives you access to all the runtime uh, objects. And so we can get assets. And now I'm just going to get codes.txt. So this is a list of all of our static assets. Path. Great. So now I've got the, the path for it. Uh, now we need to open up the file, read its contents. In order to do that, we actually need to use the file system support that's in NPM. There's a nice package called fs uh, to read the file system. And now that we have NPM support and functions, we can just say let fs equal require fs. We can bring in the file system. And now let's uh, open the file. So we go codes. So we're going to say fs.read file sync. Open up that file from the path. Uh, then that returns a um, uh, that returns a byte stream, so we're going to string it, and uh, now actually let's split it on the new line character, so that for every code that's in the um, uh, every code that's in the line, we'll get a, uh, an entry in the array here. Now let's pick one of the codes at random for each person. So let's say let code equals uh, codes. We'll index into this array math.random, which returns a uh, uh, zero to one. So we need to multiply that by the length of the array. And then we need to take the floor of that to get an index into this array, randomly picked to give us a code back. Great. Now I just need to create a response here. And we'll say code is our code. Great. Now I just save that. Boom. Now my function is deploying on Twilio. And been deployed. Great. Now I just copy the URL. I'm going to paste this in my browser, just make sure I didn't make any typos here. Great. Code Verdemilius. Got created with these codes. <laughs> we can reload this. Great. OK, so now we've got our function that's working. Uh, I'm going to take that. You get, all, you get those two codes for free. Everybody knows those two codes. So um, all right, now we're going to go back to our function here, and we're going to pick our function from the list, the secret code generator that we just wrote. We're going to click Save. And revision 946, is that? That's the gold master here. <laughs> let's, let's try it. Here, let's, oh, uh, we need to send, all, we'd send a response. Send that response, yeah. yeah. Ben's like, no, we're not done yet. Product managers always have another ticket for you. All right, so on success, we need to actually send the message. Great, so we're going to say something like, uh, great, thanks, here's your code. And now I'm going to use our template library to say uh, dot widgets dot, what's the name of our function widget, function2, dot parsed, because we actually parsed the, res the JSON response for you. And then I think code was the variable I named it, right? Here's your code. Click Save. All right, turns out 947 is our gold master. Should Perfect. we try it? Let's do it. All right. I'm going to take our phone out. And actually, we're going to go to uh, the messaging application. And we're going to go to the Twilio London office. And let's text it. Like... Jump over to QuickTime. Oh, yeah, thanks. I'm looking at it. It looks great to me. All right, here's QuickTime. Now you all can see what I'm doing. All right, so let's get that thing out of the way. So I'm going to text in. First of all, I'm just going to send a basic, like, like, hi, yeah, hi, there you go. So I don't have the password. And we'll get back that standard reply that just says, welcome to Twilio, thanks. But if you're in the know, like all of you are, you type in signal without the capital. Or either way. Either way. Either way. So signal is our secret password. And now I'm going to trigger my function that I wrote. It's going to pull that database. And here's my secret code, Episki. Very cool. So now if you're in the UK, you can text a UK geo and get that code. But if you're not from the UK, uh, you need another way. So let's figure out how to do that. Well, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, Twilio has this new channels product that actually we've connected Twilio into all these other forms of communication. You know, we've got HipChat, Alexa, SendGrid, Line, Facebook Messenger. So we actually wired up uh, a Facebook Messenger page. Uh, to this instance of Twilio. And now, if you message with Facebook Messenger, it'll go straight to that flow, because we wired it up to this flow, and it'll work as well. So let's try that out as well. So we're going to go back. We've got Messenger on here somewhere. Here on the bottom. Oh, yeah, right there. Look at that. Very good. You can search for Twilio. And UK Chatbot is the chatbot we've wired it up to. And now we can do the same thing again. Say test, hello, and... 
we should just get back the hello, you know, welcome to Twilio. Sometimes Facebook Messenger is a little pokey. <laughs> and while, while we're waiting for that response, I'll start typing our secret password. Hmm? There you go. Welcome to Twilio. All right, great. Now, signal is our password. So now that should trigger my function and give me, uh, give me our, our new passcode. There we are. Sectrum Sempra. There you go. So there you have it. In, uh, in about 10 minutes, we built a flow that works uh, on IVR, works on the phone, that takes natural language understanding, voice recognition, chatbot for SMS, and Facebook Messenger, all in about 10 minutes in a way that's completely supportable in the future going forward, because we've got this drag and drop interface that anybody can use. That's really cool. Let's hear it for Ben. Thank you for the demo. All right. Now, we're, we're really excited about this product, because when we talk to customers, accelerating your roadmap is one of the number one things we hear from customers that we can help with. Here's another way we see we can help accelerate your roadmap is by not only of Studio, we can actually templatize these flows so that instead of starting with a blank canvas, you actually can start with some popular use cases. So, you know, there's flows for appointment reminders or chatbots or all, a whole bunch of different use cases that we can get you started with by accelerating your development with some templates. So we're really exciting, uh, excited to get, uh, to get this in your hands. Uh, you can uh, text signal to that phone number or send signal to our Twilio UK chatbot, just search for it on Messenger, just like I did, uh, and get your secret code. I'll leave that up for a minute, take some pictures if you want, uh, to get your secret code to get your access as, uh, as quickly as possible. You'll be at the first of the line to get in. And thank you for coming today. Got it? All right, so let's talk for a minute about uh, pricing. So one of the key things that Twilio believes is that uh, the key, the prerequisite to uh, innovation is experimentation. So we want to make it easy for everyone to get started and start building experiments. And so Twilio Studio starts free, and you get unlimited flows for free. Because we don't want any barriers between you and starting to build your idea. Now, once you have an idea that you really like and your customers like it and you start scaling, it costs just 99 pounds a month. And you get unlimited flows, and it unlocks the things you need for you know, really production-scale applications like version controls and things like that. And now for uh, enterprise customers, we added a few more things, like single sign-on, role-based access control, some advanced security features, and our enterprise plan starts at 10,000 pounds a month. So we feel like we've got something for everybody in this mix to meet the unique requirements of every kind of company. And so we're really excited about Studio, because when we think about every part of that engagement cloud that we have, and all of those apps, notifications, bots, contact centers, mobile workforce, we think Studio makes every one of these applications more powerful, faster to build, more flexible than ever before. And this is just the beginning of the vision that Twilio has for the Twilio Engagement Cloud, all designed to help you build more compelling engagements with your customers. And it's a whole stack, starting with the super network for global connectivity, imperative APIs for every type of communications, in our programmable communications cloud, as well as those intelligent services that let you get more done faster. And now the new declarative APIs in the engagement cloud and the visual builder, you have every tool imaginable to start building and to ship amazing customer engagement for your companies. We cannot wait to see what you build. So we launched a lot of stuff today. Really excited to get your feedback, hear how we can further help you, and have a lot of conversations between Twilio. There's a lot of Twilio folks here today, and all of you. And we hope that we've given you everything that you need for the next year to build some amazing stuff. We can't wait to see what you build. Have a great day today. We'll see you tonight at Bash for our big, geeky after party. It starts at 5 PM tonight. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us at Signal. We can't wait to talk to you more today. Have a great day.